Jake Ross and Houston tomorrow, and um, do this every month. I think maybe all of you guys have been here every month, uh, and or some of them, and um, so maybe I'll just get on to. I'm pretty excited to have Jaime here from Cape Brief Conservancy, uh, and just wanted to say as an intro is that we are just in tomorrow's trying to figure out our role in in the world of children and nature and urbanism and quality of life and all those things play together. Uh, we've been talking to Jaime a bunch about you know, what could our role be in um, supporting these things and there was there there have been various children in nature networks and things and we might be moving towards really some stuff like that. Um, so that my, that's my intro. So we're trying to figure out what tomorrow really should do in this world. But with that, I'll give you time. Um, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Jaime. It's good to see you. I've met a few of you before. Um, Jake, do you want me to stand up or do you want me to, is it okay to sit down or how do you want to do this? Um, I know you're filming it. So yeah. So maybe I'll go ahead and stand, stand up. Stand yeah. I got a couple of cue cards, which I usually don't do, but I wanted to get the facts right. Uh, there's some exciting research going on. So my name is Jaime Gonzalez, and um, I'm very excited that Houston Tomorrow is kind of uh, trying to figure out where they can fit in what has become a, uh, a growing interest in looking at how we grow future cities in, um, in a responsible way and include nature into that mix. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is, as much as anything, it's a thought exercise into a few of the things that um, both the Katie Perry Conservancy, who I work for, and other um, conservation folks like John Jacob and other folks have been talking about in terms of, of better uniting the, the quality of life folks with the, the natural resources or uh, folks. And so, don't pretend to have all the answers today. I have probably more questions than you guys, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to do my best at, at, at providing a couple of different things that I think could work. The encouraging thing is some of these things are getting off the ground already. Um, we haven't figured out all these things, but we're going ahead anyway, and uh, there's, some, there's some messiness to it and some chaos to it, but I believe that there's, you know, a lot of good can come out of that process. So, real quickly, I work for the Katy Perry Conservancy uh, with the Conservancy. I do um, restoration of prairies, and I run all the, and design all the educational programming, uh, pre-K through graduate pro programs. And so I am by training, um, I have a biology degree and a science education master's. So I get to play around with, with both aspects of, of those two different fields and see the interconnections between them and new media and all that stuff. So it's a very exciting place to work. We always have a lot of things going on. Very likely you'll be hearing about us very soon uh, in the news if you haven't yet about uh, several roads that may be planned going through us. If you haven't heard about that, you will be hearing about that soon, or they're trying to plan around us. Anyway, stay tuned for that. Um, several years ago, I also founded uh, this institution, Coastal of Prairie Partnership, and this is a uh, all-volunteer, um, very kind of lightweight in terms of financial resources, nonprofit, but. We hope it is starting to have something of an impact in terms of people understanding um, the ecosystem that I'm passionate about, which is prairies, and I'm passionate about all the ecosystems, but this one in particular. And uh, and so much of the much of what I'm talking about today is going to uh, talk about not necessarily policy, but education, and how we how we get to that. Because I think there are some things that are limiting cooperation between these different groups and also greater success with the general public. And then afterward, I'd like to reserve some time so we can, we can put a group this small, we can have a good uh, dialogue. So um, just real quickly, this is more, this is my office. So the, all, everything in green is a preserve system that has been mostly pieced together by the Katy Perry Conservancy. It is, at the end of this year, we think it'll be about 21,000 acres. Some of it we own, some of it we, with, uh, with uh, usage agreements with landowners. Um, it is uh, uh, kind of small in comparison with the rest of the Houston, but it, when you're out there, it's pretty darn big. We can actually fit Manhattan Island and two memorial parks on that spot. So um, it's pretty big, and because it's pretty big, um, you can get a sweep of nature. You can get uh, an idea of what 
this area has looked like over the last several thousand years at least. Um, so we do have wild spots like this, is one of my favorite spots to go to. Um, we also have a lot of wetlands. We have about 2,500 acres of wetlands. Um, and those wetlands, actually, this wetland here, I got a text from my land manager yesterday, and he got, uh, he spotted two new alligators out there yesterday. So we have beaver and otter and all sorts of things in these wetlands. But I was teaching, I taught 400 middle schoolers yesterday, uh, Katie Junior High, and, uh, and that's probably about as exhausting as it sounds. But they were great kids. Uh, but being kids in the Katy area, uh, they had very little idea of why Katy was on the map to begin with, or what, what drove the economy of Katy, or, or anything like that. They had, they had all these facts and figures, they could do some basic algebra, they could apply the scientific method to a greater or lesser degree, they knew some Texas history facts, they knew all these things, except the one thing that, that I think is incredibly important, where do you live? What is that place like? What made it? What are the connections between you and your family in that place? We're not real good at that in schools, teaching about place. And if we're not very good at teaching about place, I'm not sure that we're very good at teaching about citizenship. Um, so I had a girl at the very end of this thing ask me, why do you rebuild these prairies? Why do you, why do you work to, to raise money to save these places? I thought about it for a second, and and I said, you know, it's because I love people. You know, the frogs and the birds and the bees and all those things. I believe have a fundamental right to exist, but at the at the root of it, it's a people thing. It is a people thing. People need nature, not just for the obvious reasons, but some of the not so obvious reasons. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. These are some rice farmers that work our Nelson Farms Preserve. And when I see them out there working and I greet them and when they're har at harvest time and all this stuff, I know that their, their quality of life is very high because they're, they get to work with the land. They get to be out there doing what they like to do. They're, they're communing with the land. And so as I talk about all these issues about bringing nature back into the city in, in a more aggressive way uh, and in a more complete way, I'm reminded of these guys and how much how much they treasure the land itself, and, and taking a little bit of that and bring it into the city, I think, would be a, a good thing. All right. So, why the quality of life? Well, all of you guys are quality of life aficionados or experts or both. Okay. And I think that a lot of times we want to jump to the the what. What do we need? We need to do this policy. Make it more easier, financially uh, responsible to do X. We need to move the, the bike lane. We need to make them wider. We need to put up the posts and everything. But I think that we, we make a mistake sometimes by going ex exactly to the what instead of the why. So, in your own words, so I can hear from your own uh, perspective, why do you care about quality of life issues? Why do you spend time? sailing in the Caribbean or, you know, doing something else. Why do you spend time on this stuff? Quality of life issues. No matter what the quality of life issue is, why do you do it? We're all busy. We've got to carve time out for it. What does it matter? Is it a survival thing for us as humans? It just makes life more enjoyable. I think it helps me.
would say, as we see, as we see our urban area densifying more and more and more, it becomes the quality of life. We can we can sort of envision where we might be heading if we don't do right. what we're trying to do. Right. So what I heard was, and those are all excellent. Um, it's about human happiness, and that's borne out by living in an interesting place that's multifaceted and complex. And it's about avoiding a city that we don't, we wouldn't want to live in, in the future. Um, and I think that that's, um, those are all very important reasons. I don't know if you've seen this guy, and this is a kind of a crazy promotional picture of this guy. He looks kind of salesman-like. This guy gave a talk on TED um, back in 2009, and it continues to be one of these ones that get replayed and replayed and replayed. And he, he came up with uh, this idea of the golden circle. I, I seriously doubt he's the first person to come up with that. But he does a very good job of kind of ex telling you why a lot of products and a lot of companies don't, aren't successful because they're starting at the wrong place. They start with what? This is our product. Don't you want to buy it? Instead of trying to reach a very human place, why are we doing what we're doing? What are we sitting in this room for? And going from that, so he you know, talks a little bit about Apple computers. And he says, you know, Apple computer for, in a conventional sense, would say, we're a computer company, and we make computers, and do you want to buy one? But in his talk, he talks about the fact that Apple computers are not structured that way. Apple computer is about saying, we are a very different kind of, of entity. We're about being different. We're about being creative. That's what we're about. We only happen to build computers. Don't you want to buy one? And, and you know, I, I think he's, from an educational standpoint, I think he's definitely on to something really, really uh, important. When we work in quality of life issues, whether it's working on uh, staging a build a, a build a better block, about safety issues, interest level, greenery, and all that stuff. Or if we're working with uh, issues regarding mass transit, or if we're working with helping to uh, diffuse some of these food deserts, I think that sometimes what happens in the, the messaging of campaigns is that we lose the why. The, we go right to the what. We problem solvers as people. We want to fix the problem. And then when everybody doesn't line up behind us, we go, what is the problem? I've given them the facts. But from an educational standpoint, we know that the facts are not sufficient because we are both rational beings, but we're also highly emotional beings. So a little bit of what I'm talking about today is policy-based, which is really kind of a rational thing. But a lot of it is how do we talk to people about these ideas? And how do we combine ideas to make them make sense to people? Start off with why we need uh, nature in a little bit more uh, basic sense, and then we're going to go into how I think maybe all of us who care about quality of life can maybe make some, some inroads. I think one of the things when I talk to not just kids but adults uh, these days uh, that I see is there's a, there's a fundamental psychic disconnect with nature sometimes. Not with folks that are a little bit older who grew up playing outside. But certainly, anybody from 20 below, I, I, I talk to thousands of people, and there is this psychic disconnect with nature oftentimes. Not always, but oftentimes. And what I mean by that is, it is only cognitive. It's not based in reality. Because in reality, we are incredibly attuned and controlled and connected with nature. Um, a couple of of examples that I probably don't even need to share with you, but just how utterly connected we actually are versus what we think we are. So there was a Harvard uh, physicist who, who did a, a little bit of a thought uh, exercise years ago, and he thought about what, what air we breathe in, what we breathe out. And he thought, you know, 99% of the air that we breathe is oxygen or nitrogen, and about 1% is argon. It's a gas that goes in your body, you don't metabolize it, you don't use it, so you breathe it in and then you breathe it back out. And he said, I wonder how connected we are to one another and to all the living things on this planet. So what he did is he did some fancy calculations. And he recognized that if you breathed in about 
15 argon uh, atoms uh, for every breath. That if you breathed in this argon, you breathed it back out, but in the first few minutes, those atoms had pervaded your neighborhood. And so anybody outside had a chance of breathing your argon atom. But the remarkable thing was, because of the circulation of air currents in the atmosphere, he calculated that every adult human in the, in the last year has breathed some of the argon atoms that were expelled by every new baby on planet Earth. We are that connected. The environment sometimes is portrayed as something out there, separate from people, but it pervades our bodies. In fact, some of the most in interesting work being done that shows this human body connection and how much we think we're human, but and in, in other ways, we're really a super organism. It's, it's really fascinating. There have been uh, several studies that have looked at kind of, you know, what makes up a human being? Are we one organism? Are we many organisms? Are we a super organism? And it turns out that there are about a thousand species of other things inside and on human beings that we carry more than a thousand organisms within us and on us. And in fact, there are 10 bacterial cells in our bodies for every one human cell. So are we just a bacterial colony with the human transport system? I don't know. I don't know. In fact, they've just looked at, uh, there's a really wonderful report of NPR that talked about the gut-brain connection and how the bacteria and the types of bacteria that they find in the human gut has actually been shown to change the basic architecture of the human mind. That those folks with bacteria that code for less stressful uh, personality, they actually have a different population of bacteria in their gut than people who are anxious and nervous. And if they feed them a probiotic diet, with the bacteria that the more calm people have, guess what? They turn more calm too. We are soaking in nature. It is soaking through us. And so therefore, it's not, it's not at all, if you really want to be either grossed out or fascinated, I, I really encourage you to read that our life of our wild bodies. Talks a lot about this human microbiome. So it is no um, it is no great leap to think. If we are deprived of nature, it starts to have some seriously deleterious effects. So um, one of the things that has been going on with the Children in Nature Initiative, um, and even before that, is people have been looking at how does exposure to nature affect human beings? And some real uh, neat things have come out of that. One is, that just as a case study, uh, Robert Berger still there, but he did a, a, a surgery recovery experiment, or a, a study back in 1984 uh, when he published this paper, and, and he was looking at post-operative patients, people who were in the hospital, people who uh, who've had a, a pretty invasive procedure, and what he did is he set some of those post-operative patients up in rooms without a view. Actually, they had a view of a brick wall in this case. And some of the other patients, he set up the experimental uh, population he set up in a room with a view of leafy trees. Turns out the folks that he put in the rooms with leafy trees went home a day earlier, had much less pain medication prescribed to them, and had fewer post-operative procedures. Nature is so powerful that it doesn't have to do anything. It can just simply be. If you are interacting and viewing it, it does its work. Folks have taken a look, and this is a very kind of exciting new field, uh, where they're really looking at the outdoor exposure and academic achievement. There was a study done in California that was published back in 2005, and it was looking at at-risk kids, 56% of which had never reported having extensive experiences in the outdoors. And what they found was that there was, uh, and this is a different study, but there was like a 27% increase in their achievement for science class. Part of that surely is coming from manipulating and touching and interacting with uh, these things that they're studying in, in, in science, but some of it is just simply due uh, to the fact
focusing effect of nature. This, uh, this other study right here, my, my, I came across this the other day. You know, one of the great, uh, one of the, the things that everybody understands at this point, anybody who lives in an urban environment in 2014 knows that the part of our brain that codes for fear is on constant tripwire. Every beep of a cell phone, every email that comes in, every phone call that gets uh, placed, every time we're on the road and there's a careless driver, every time we turn on the news, the, the you know really the I, I see it this way. A lot of times the news is there to stimulate your amygdala. It's that part of the brain that really works with emotion and fear. Their job is to constantly make that fire over and over. So many things in our modern world, especially in cities that aren't designed well for human beings and other living things, are made to trip your sphere of sense, your sensibility, your anxiety. And so when Mark Berman and his colleagues at the University of Michigan did this study, he looked at how do people perform on tasks where you have to be focused, because all this fear can really get you kind of uh, unfocused and irritable and, and anxiety-filled. And, he's in, and he's, as it says right here, they improved by 20% just by taking a short walk. And then he said, well, let me see if just the implication of nature is enough. So what he did is he took some of these in a, in a follow-up study, and he just showed pictures of, of nature to people for 10 minutes. Pictures in a room. They scored almost as high on those tests as people who had taken a walk around the arboretum from a cognitive standpoint, from a health standpoint, we need nature. And I think about nature in this way. We're enamored with technology. Enamored with it. I mean, I'm enamored with it. I know Jay's enamored with it. We all are. Nature is very ancient technology. And I tend to think of it that way. Very ancient. It's so ancient, bless you, we don't even know really precisely when it started uh, with a degree of, uh, no, well, we, have, we have certain intervals, but it's so complicated, this technology, that even a single ant that I find on the prairie is much more complicated technology than anything that human beings have built. Even an ant, more efficient, more complicated, more complicated certainly than any chemical factory in the world. So I would say, you know, what I would say is, Let's bring together this ancient technology that is very useful, just as useful as any medical equipment for people, and let's combine it with modern design, modern architecture, modern transportation infrastructure to create a, a new living place for human beings. So just one step further before we get into uh, the, the meat of the talk, uh, one thing that, uh, that has not been I don't think scientifically proven is the word. There's a uh, mounting body of evidence in support of this theory first brought forth by a uh, Harvard entomologist named Neil Wilson. And this is biophilia hypothesis. Basically, that we have a natural affinity for wild things. Not just green spaces. When I say green, when I think of green spaces, I think of trees shooting up through lawns. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. I'm talking about an affinity for biodiversity, different life forms themselves. And we see this all the time. People have pets. People choose to be national parks. People choose to do these things because it is feeding something that we have carried with us as a species for the, from the beginning of time, probably. And I think that when you, and uh, one of the kind of the, <laughs> the things that's interesting about this biophilia theory is Wilson posits that we create places that remind us of where we've been evolutionarily. You know, if you look at this, this acacia on the savannas of, of Africa where, where many folks think that, that, that humans arose, it's not hard to believe that what we've done is we've re-engineered our habitat, our living place here in the city, to emulate that. Do we have any places that look like this? Big trees with a little bit shorter grass? You bet. 
reasons that mockingbirds are so prolific in the city is they're edge species. And we are an edge species. We like the edge. And so what we've done in a lot of circumstances is our entire neighborhoods have become edge habitats. We've engineered our habitats as a memory of what where we've been. But we have done kind of an incomplete job of So in this time of increasing stress with the population, increasing disease rates, and some of those diseases really spurred by stress, at a time when children are really losing, um, and adults are losing this fundamental connection with nature, and this, this disconnect is so strong, if I talk to kids in eighth grade, they don't understand that bread came from a plant. That's how strong this disconnect is. And then I told them yesterday that leather came from cows and they couldn't believe that. <laughs> okay, that's how strong this disconnect can be. Um, in fact, I went to a school last year and as I was working on this little prairie garden, people were like, uh, the teacher's like, well, let's get rubber gloves on the kids. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why is that? Oh, they had, if there's bacteria, there's bacteria in the soil. <laughs> and I had to take her inside and I said, there's been a recent study that's been done where they cultured the skin bacteria off of kids who have high asthma rates and kids who have uh, no asthma. And they found that the biological community on their skins is fundamentally different. And the biological community on their skins was closer to the soil. So the kids who were actually playing in the soil had decreased rates of asthma. We, we, we think we know a lot, but really, nature is this big mystery. It's a wonderful mystery. And so we've seen the, the, the symptoms of this disconnect, and that kind of spurred Richard Liu, who was just a, a journalist, and now has become a real champion for getting kids outdoors to write this last child in the woods. And this is not a scientific diagnosis. It's nature deficit disorder. But it is an accumulation of symptoms that is real and is happening and is discernible. The average child today spends seven minutes outside in unorganized play. I'm not talking soccer, I'm talking about just being able to manipulate things outside, go out and play. Conversely, they spend over seven hours in front of an electronic screen a day. So he wrote this book and he lit a fire because people around the country obviously had been seeing the symptoms. Now, as we go into the next part of the, the, not the why, but the how and the what, how do we get to a wilder place? I'll have this caveat for you. We're never gonna get to what we used to have. And in a lot of ways, I think you're gonna be grateful for that. <laughs> Houston was an incredibly wild city when the settlers first got here. These are a few of the birds that have gone um, the way of the dodo, no pun intended, um, in our area. Uh, that was a native parakeet that we had, uh, passenger pigeon, obviously a, a very large woodpecker called ivory bill woodpecker. But we also have these. Jaguar were reported in the creeks. We had lots of cougar around. Red wolves were our natural wolf. Rattlesnakes and even ocelot would pop up every once in a while. And then there were here called a place called Bear Creek. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important to recognize, for me anyway, how wild do we want to make it? I think that their techniques are there to make it really wild. But how wild is too wild? So we'll talk about that. So the how and the what. Well, this is a process that's already started in a lot of ways. How do we make a wilder city for people and for wildlife? Well, one thing to know is this bond that was passed with the uh, Greenways Initiative is, you know, they're already starting to do some, some, some planning for spaces and acquisition and all that stuff. This is going to be um, an interconnected series of, uh, of trails, and we hope, we're hoping to link outside of Harris County with these trails at some point with some of the conservation groups. But this kind of connectivity, when it's finally realized, if it's done appropriately, and what I mean by that from a biological sense is, if it's not just long all the way, it's going to provide an influx into the city of some true wildness. So we have been working with the Buffalo by the, or the, uh, the, the Parks Board, rather, um, to try to get a handle on how can we not just put a bunch of trees in the lawn, but how can we bring back some of the ancient grasses and flowers and shrubs and things to make living corridors, not just green spaces that people like looking at, but living corridors. So very much trying to think out that process, knowing that the wilder you make it, maybe the less comfortable people will be. 
I think that would be great for all of us to do, um, and I certainly don't have all the answers to this, is to build new types of coalitions, maybe for single issues. One thing that uh, David Crossley and John Jacobs and I did uh, several years back was we worked on an editorial for the Chronicle. Now, this was not supposed to be the title in the Journey on Metro and Improved Life uh, Lifestyles. You'd never have a, a movie producer coming up with that title. It's pretty bad. Our title was Why Wild Ducks Love Light Rail. <laughs> but the proposition, the prepos proposition was that my precious Katy Prairie is being overwhelmed by development. Any forces that encourage an outward sprawl instead of improving the city and getting some inflow, like creating a better, more robust transportation system, is going to hurt us on the Katy Prairie. So, should I care about a light rail in the middle of the city of Houston as a conservationist on the, on the extreme part of Houston? Absolutely, 100%. I have to figure out what are the forces that are driving people out that way, and can we do a double dip? Can we make the city more livable for people and take some of the pressure off the of wild ecosystems? We sure can. Well, David was really successful at getting people to sign off on this, but we need more of this. The natural resources folks are very used to working in the countryside, but the truth is almost 90% of Texans are city dwellers. Those natural resource people have to figure that out. Folks like John have figured that out, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is just starting to get to that point where they go, ah, all the people and most of the money are in the cities. Maybe we should care about the cities. Because the people in the city, if they don't know what we are, they're not going to care about us. So this was an instance where there was a joint, uh, there was a joint need to address this issue, and we were able to sign off the, on it with the Coastal Prairie Partnership because we believe that that would help prairies. But we need to think broadly about these connections. You know, it shouldn't be that there are the transportation folks and the food desert folks only, and the and the folks over here working, and the natural resources folks over here. We need to actually have dialogue about how are we all connected? How can we be helpful to one another? Now this is going to break your heart as an architectural guy. But um, uh, that building right there was gutted. That's the Houston main building, right? And we um, were asked by uh, Andy Anderson, and that, that doesn't go down with well with architectural <laughs> historians. <laughs> but we did, we made lemons out of lemonade, or lemonade out of lemons, right? What we did is we went in here and we uh, did several applications of seeding. And we created this one and a half acre prairie in the middle of the Texas Medical Center in Fannin and, and Holcomb. So instead of just putting in a huge lawn, which is an incredible resource waster, and also affects the quality of the rivers, and therefore the animals that live in the rivers. We built a sustainable landscape. For now, wild animals are using it, but also sick people are coming and visiting. And this is because my group, Kitty Prairie Conservancy, and some other groups are saying, let's go where the people are. Let's move the people where they are. Let's not do this typical model of sitting at our reserve out in the middle of the sticks. And then expect that somehow people are just going to get excited about it and come and see us someday. That just doesn't happen. I've been through a lot of these preserves. One of the, one of the real gems in all of the state of Texas biologically is the Big Thicket National Preserve just northeast of Houston. It is a biological wonderland that's really wonderful. 86,000 people visit it a year. About 70,000 people go to a typical home game for the Texas. UNESCO World Site, UN Biological Site, 86,000 people a year. So what I'm saying is, if we don't reach out as natural resource professionals to city dwellers and situate nature that they can understand in the city, I think that we're going to have a very hard time in this time when kids aren't getting outside, having these future Houstonians come and visit us or fund us. So we need to take a real uh, aggressive thing of putting nature back into the city as natural resources folks. One other thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to work on consumer behavior. Um, it's
it's not just good enough to have policy. You know, policy is fantastic and it's an incredibly important part. But I'm talking about inspiring people to be different and making it easy for them to understand what change means and how to change. This is the this is my teaching philosophy in a nutshell. This is what you know, I have a master's in, in science education and I've taught thousands upon thousands of people at this point. But if I could sum up my educational philosophy, this is it. Don't try to teach everything. Pick something that is that people can rally around and then let them go explore and create for themselves. And I think this can be done in a lot of ways. One thing that we've been working on since uh, 2000 and well, 12 now is we've been trying to rally people to come up with a rebranding effort for the outdoors in Houston. I think that one of the big stumbling blocks that we have in this town, and there might be some disagreement about this, is that a lot of people, even native Houstonians, and I've heard a couple of them mayors say some derogatory things, just don't understand what they have. They don't know what they have here from a natural history perspective, from a nature perspective, how special it is, how diverse it is, how wonderful it is, even in comparison with places that we deem to be very diverse, like Portland and Seattle. So one thing that we initiated a while back was this Get Out Here campaign. And this is launching on Earth Day this year. And this is gonna be, we hope, the go-to outdoor activity website for our area. In order for people to be inspired, they gotta know where to go. They gotta find the inspirational stories. So it's gonna take more than a website. It's gonna take a whole rebranding campaign. We've engaged Tweet uh, Marketing Firm to come up with a whole campaign that will be on TV, radio, print ads, the airport. And basically the upshot is get out of your normal mode and go to a nature place or go outside. Get outside because the outside is a place where you can be stressed. The outside is a place where you can find greater happiness. And fortunately, we have many, many institutions that have completely bought off on this and we're courting the Greater Houston Partnership and we think that we're gonna get their, their, their support and their approval as well as the city of Houston. So a lot of people are kind of catching on to this and saying, you know, it's one thing to tell kids to you know, eat better and to you know, do X, Y, Z, but we gotta send them to some places they wanna be. They gotta, they gotta get inspired to go outside. Another thing I think that's gonna be very necessary is this. This is the packaging. I know the, 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 the product that I'm selling, Nature in Houston, is a good product. It's a quality product. It's a really good product. The packaging, though, has not always been very good. It's not. It's not good. We're not doing a good sales job. So one of the things that I think that we should be looking at as a natural resources community and as a quality of life community is literally cultivating some media personalities <sighs> Um, to sell this notion, to get people outside, to get them revved up, to get them inspired. We shouldn't wait for the news media to call us up and say, hey, we want a little dinky news story for five minutes at, or for two minutes at five o'clock, which is what we do now. We should be literally constructing some personalities to be those go-to nature people, to sell it. You know, and that's no different than the record companies. When they want a boy band, they don't say, we're gonna wait for a bunch of young, attractive teenagers to get together on their own and they're gonna form a band and then we're gonna get them. No, they go pick people, they put them together and they package them and they send them out. We need uh, to, to live in the real world of mass media. We need to engineer these opportunities, not just wait for them. Another thing about changing, um, Another thing about changing consumer behavior is we're oftentimes very obtuse when we ask them to do something positive for themselves and for wild things in the city. Oftentimes the, the old way of doing it was if somebody said, I'm kind of interested in native plants, I don't know anything about them, is we would give them a list that had 300 species on it. That's useless, might as well just burn it right there. That doesn't help anybody. Last year we worked on a on a little campaign called Nine Natives. The idea was, if you could come up with something short and memorable, and you could provide people with the product and say, you don't have to be a botanist to figure this out. We've done the figuring for you. You plant these nine things together in a cluster, and we'll give you 
some plans, you're going to be doing good. And some people say, well, they don't really know how all the plants work and all that stuff. And my counter to that was, are people, do people have to be chemical engineers in order to recycle? No. They have to know what numbers. One, two, three, four, five, and seven, or whatever. That's it. So why are we asking them to go over loads of books and lists and have to be experts about rewilding? That's ridiculous. Let's make it easier for them. So that when you go to a big box store like this, instead of having a bunch of plants that frankly have had the nectar bread out of them and are pretty useless from a wildlife perspective, and therefore I think not as useful from a human happiness perspective because you don't have as many moving bees and fly, butterflies and things to see, maybe you go to a place and in a bin you have everything you need in order to grow what you need. Another thing that we need to do is do a better job of engaging governments and civic associations. There's a huge pushback when we talk about rewilding the city. Oh my God, you're going to bring in snakes. Oh my God, you're going to bring in coyotes. You're going to decrease my home value. You're going to do all these things. But what I will remind them of is that we've had a changed world. This is what video games looked like when I was a kid. They were pretty cool. I'll tell you, I got this game in 1979. Okay? It's pretty cool. But it wasn't cool enough to keep me inside all day. You know what I mean? I mean, it was okay. But I went out and played Cowboys and Indians, and I you know, uh, built forts, and I did all this stuff. But this is what the world looks like for kids today. This technology has gotten so good that they have all of these worlds to explore and build and do. And it's a moving world. It's not a static world. It's very interactive. And at the same time that we have done that, we've created this technology to be very immersive. This is what we've done to our neighborhoods. We've cut everything that moves down. We've made them highly static. Why would a kid want to go out there? There's nothing to see. When I was a kid, I was chasing frogs and snakes and all kinds of stuff. There's nothing there. That's a dead zone. It's green, and therefore it's valuable from a psychic standpoint, but from a wildlife and kind of interesting standpoint, there have been studies that have looked at the biodiversity in a lawn, and it's been found that the biodiversity in lawns are lower than a junkyard. This is a dead zone. Not only is it a dead zone, but it's a highly toxic said dead zone. These lawns, if I could tell people to do two things in their life, it would be get rid of your lawn and all the fertilizers and poisons you put on it that leach into streams and kill the streams and make them less interesting. Do that and get your cats inside. Cats kill 300 million birds a year and over a billion mammals. They are one of the most destructive forces on the planet. So if I could tell people to do two things in, your, in the city, get rid of all this lawn, which is forcing you to mow it a lot and therefore kicking up some incredibly toxic pollutants in the air because these machines are very dirty. Increasing asthma rates, which is the number, of reasons, number one reason why kids miss school. And you have to fertilize them and put chemicals on them. And all for what? So that we can help a chemical and lawn company make their quarterly profit. That's what it's there for. They used mass media a long time ago to tell us exactly what to do. And guess what? We bid off on it. So we made a, a virtual world that is incredibly interesting and moving and dynamic. And we've made our physical world incredibly boring. So another thing that we can do is we can work together to make those blank spots on the map come back to life. This is one of my favorites. It's the power easement right here, close to the blank uh, complex. And I live right up here. Well, when I walk this, I see nothing but potential. You see, this is actually a prairie that they mow. Do you let that grow up? It'll be 33 acres of grassland habitat in the middle of the city. Now, they're already growing some gardens here. And we know that there is a real connection between urban gardens and pollinators. We know that. But oftentimes, we are not explicit about that. So a lot of times, what we do is we build these, these urban gardens, which are fantastic things. But around the periphery, there are no wild plants to feed the pollinators, to keep them around to nurture them so that they can help us back. So one thing 
thing that I would love to see is better, uh, much better communication, explicit communication, between the urban, urban garden and our urban farming folks and the wildlife experts to create true, a true living fabric that feeds not just people, but wild things as well. This is John Jacob's map. It's a pretty, pretty version of this map. It's pretty complicated right there, but uh, it's a fascinating map. And what he's done here is he's kind of mapped out what he's calling our agroecological infrastructure. But we're rewilding these cities and making them more interesting for people to be outside and, and more healthy. One thing we're going to have to do is really work hard to save the last best huge chunks where you can get out there and lose yourself. There are still some of those chunks to be had. Um, we're just going to have to work harder to get them because the land prices are increasing. So what I hope to see in the future is, as you all know, anybody who watches the news knows that there is uh, there's a lot of hum and drum about who has what rights and what group gets rights and what group doesn't get rights. But although Leopold, I think, had it right in, in the land ethic, basically wrote that since the beginning of time, we've been gradually extending rights to more and more and more groups and more and more and more different types of people. But this is an incomplete model until the rights of nature itself are included in this on this boat. So I think that uh, if we don't want to end up with something like this, this is somebody's rendering of what they would like to see in the future, this gray iron city. I think that's a really, really unhealthy vision of what the future looks like. Very unhealthy and very ignorant in that it presumes that we no longer need nature, that we're beyond nature somehow. So I don't want to see that. I want to see, and this is not the right picture, I know David's going to not be happy I use the picture, but having a green city that takes ancient technology with modern technology is a hybrid living uh, place where all living things, all Houstonians, the birds and the bees and the people too, are alive and healthy. Uh, before we go out in outer space, right? Um, you know, it, it's not for nothing that when we make these constructions of where we want to go in the future, we carry this little piece of earth with us. We need it. Our, our, soul, our souls need it. Our minds need it. Um, and it's, it's very important that we try to get there together because it's going to be a lot harder if we all try it by ourselves. All right. Do I have any time for questions or conversation or anything? Yeah. Yes, sir. One of the questions I had. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm aware of an island of wilderness that is probably been sold to commercial development, but it is perfectly situated to be a wilderness area, fenced off and visited from McGregor Park. Oh. It's the area bounded by Bray's Bayou on the north, the Spur 5 freeway extension on the east, OST on the south, and Martin Luther King Boulevard and McGregor Park on the west. And everybody drives by it every day, you see the big forest of trees, and pays no attention to it. Yeah but it's probably all going to be bulldozed and put in high-rise development overlooking a bunch of other high-rise developments on Braves Bio, the uh, school dormitories right across the bio mm -hmm. to the north of it. And I would ideally like to see this kept as a wilderness area, fenced off but, but uh, undeveloped, and have tours for school children to go in there and see what Houston looks like on its own without any intervention of man. You know, that's just my ideal I, I, idea of that. So enough said about that, but I just wanted to point out that location to you and if there's anything to be done. You know, Does U of H own that? I know that I actually visited that site with some biologists from U of H uh, several years back just to do a survey. And I don't know who owns that land, it's but I know exactly what you're talking about. any neighborhood. It's perfectly surrounded by freeways yeah. and bios all around yeah. it. And that's a great example of this dilemma, because if what you're talking about is mixed-use trans-oriented development and high-density going in there, that will save 
many, many, many more times the acreage of wild land uh, versus developing that same amount of people living on the prairie. And so it's a huge issue with the, the concept of preserving wild spaces in the cities have to be balanced with do we mean we should pretend that we're preserving wild spaces by having everyone live out in the prairie. Uh, so it, that, that's a great, I think, example of, the whole, of, of how we need to work this out. Well, I think Jay brings up an incredibly important point. I mean, it'd be very easy to be Pollyannish and say, yeah, we should just save every green space in the city, and, but we are trying to balance this high-density model, transit-heavy model, and still have some green space in the city, and you've got a limited footprint, and they're expensive, and all that stuff. Part of the reason why I'm such a proponent now that legislation has been passed to limit liability for power companies along power easements of rewilding those power easements is because nobody can build anything there. You can't build anything there. But they're wasting an incredible amount of gasoline and pollutants in mowing those things over and over again. So that seems to me an energy, uh, a savings for the company. Uh, rewilding without very much effort in some cases. Um, and there's no mixed use that's going to go on there. Because it's, uh, I too was a child who enjoyed going to wild areas and playing with the frogs and climbing the trees and whatever, but it was uh, not just a manicured grass and a picnic table, which is out of concept of the park. Right. So, anyway. Right. Yes, sir. Um, I guess in thinking about rewilding um, Houston and thinking about the old animals that used to be a part of Houston, I guess my question is then, when we're thinking about doing this whole idea, do we then try to locate those animals and then we, um, I guess, introduce them into the Houston area? Or are we more so just trying to create more of the livable, but then also like diverse uh, biological things in the neighborhood and hoping that the animals that currently exist kind of like move around in those areas? That's a really good question. Now, when you look up, if you look up rewilding on the internet, it has a slightly different context, working at much larger land scales. It was actually coined to talk about creating huge buffalo commons in the upper Midwest or, or bringing back even some ancient animals to, to landscapes and whatnot. So I kind of use that term kind of tongue in cheek because you're never going to get buffalo herds back in Houston. But it's an excellent question. I think what we have in Houston is the, the ability to create what are called novel ecosystems. Novel ecosystems aren't completely composed of the species that were here originally, but rather are a hybrid between those species and all the things that we planted because we love them. I have a, for instance, I have a rose, a uh, little bit of a rose garden in my backyard. Those roses are, are heritage roses that my wife's grandma gave her. If I ripped those out in favor of natives, she would kill me. And so I think it's very important as the natural resource community interfaces with people that don't have a lot of affinity or experience with natives that we say that it can be a part of the mix. You don't have to rip everything out. And I think that, you know, in terms of building these microhabitats for recharging humans, I think that, you know, it's the Bull Durham principle. If you build it, they'll get there. They'll come. Uh, I have seen, even from small little tiny plantings in the middle of the city, after two or three years, you have these highly exotic beetles that just kind of show up out of nowhere, and you don't even know how they got there uh, or found it. But if you if you build it, they'll get there. Now, there's going to be some human-wildlife interactions that we might not be keen about. Right. But the price of not having extensive nature in a place far outweighs, I think, those incidents. If that answers your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, um, so it was great, great uh, stuff you put out here. You know, what I, so one first question, you know, would be how much, because we use this word wilderness a few times. Yes. So I'm familiar with the area we're talking about here. You know, as a natural resource person, right. I'd be hard put to call that wilderness right. myself. Right. Um, uh, but that's, that's one issue. But the other is, you know, do we, obviously we need, we need to go out like what you said, place where you just soak it in. But is it enough in the city? Let's say we take a park like Baldwin Park. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Baldwin Park right on, uh, is it Eldon, I think?
If you could have a park like Baldwin Park within five minutes of where you are, right. now that's not that's not a river. It's not natural. It's certainly not wilderness. We would all agree it's not wilderness. But yet, you know, kids you go in there. And you've got green, you've got lawn. 